even uh, I think Wikipedia <coughs> talks about my poor grades. So I, I got B average in uh, college, and I almost uh, flunked out of graduate school. <laughs> and I did. Uh, fl I went to undergrad. I was an undergraduate in physics major, and I was do doing bad enough. I had to switch to math, math in my senior year. So I, w I took the other extreme. I wasn't <laughs> paying too much attention to what the teachers were saying or even learning. I was doing, you know, learning of other things than science. And eventually, in the last years of graduate school, then I started uh, paying more attention to learning math and doing math. But I think there's something important about this independence. I, was brought up in a way like that. Uh, I went to a one-room schoolhouse for eight years. And in a one-room schoolhouse, we had one teacher teach eight grades. <laughs> and the teacher didn't know, know hardly anything. <laughs> so I mean, she hadn't finished college. And, you know, her level of science, for example, was very low. But, you know, but I, it was okay because it gave a freedom for, for me and other students too to to learn their own ways, and uh, they couldn't learn too much from the teacher because she had to teach eight classes, eight years, and each year I had two or three classes so, mm -hmm. or four. So that country style of life might, might have been helpful. My mother was always trying to consolidate that school, make it part of a big system, but <laughs> maybe it was better that way. I don't know. Uh, well, you know, it's, I have a funny, it's a funny career. Uh, my my high school science teacher discouraged me from going to Ann Arbor because he said uh, there's too many big city kids there who I couldn't compete with. And you know, I had, I had some self confidence, so I went. And then I took a freshman honors class, uh, which was a challenge, and I, you know. Got to the I was at the top, A pluses and so on, for the first year. And after that, I, f I felt confident. And then I got next year, I took calculus, got a C. So I didn't worry about things too much after that. I felt I could do it. And I had other interesting things to, that I wanted to do, so I didn't really uh, learn too much more. I did more routine things until in math failing <laughs> physics, and then graduate school, still not doing too well for a while, and they threatened to kick me out, so then I, and I found an inspiring teacher, Ronald Bott, and uh, so the last couple of years, he, he actually left to where Princeton and I did my thesis and without him. Also, you know, partly just the world around me, the people around me, uh, uh, and partly, you know, my mathematics, uh, I try to keep it fairly broad, and then uh, it gives me tools to work in different areas. I mean, like for example, uh, maybe it was seven years ago, I was working in pattern recognition uh, with Tommy Poggio at MIT. And it, so what we were doing is trying to, uh, you know, recognize faces and recognize cats and dogs. And what we did was to uh, use the uh, system in the brain, the uh, Huber weasel patches in the brain, uh, and they would fit together in different layers. And that gave us some kind of mathematical uh, foundations for vision. But then uh, I was in a computer science institute, Toyota Technological Institute, and I heard uh, various talks by computer scientists working in uh, biology and DNA. And at some point, uh, it seemed to me that was a lot easier than what I was doing because vision uses two dimensional bunch of pixels. So, you know, two dimensions versus one dimension string is two dimensions much harder. So I figured what I was doing with pattern recognition, I could do much more, more with DNA. So, uh, you know, I talked to some biologists who came by and they said, like, well, I gave lectures where I mentioned that idea, lectures on uh, vision, and uh, I mentioned the idea of using these ideas for uh, DNA, 
and that it was always corroborated by the people who knew about these things. And so that gave me a lot of encouragement. And that was the transition time when I was moving back to Hong Kong from Chicago. And when I got there, they got a huge amount of support. They gave me you know, everything. That's why I moved. In particular, uh, I could put together a group working and uh, we learned uh, the biology uh, and used these pattern recognition techniques to understand strings. So we're doing uh, immunology, uh, learning theory of machine learning. And that's the way it started into biology. Then uh, after a while, I got interested more in uh, you know, not just, uh, you know, kind of this uh, machine learning type biology, computational biology, but understanding mm -hmm. more deeply uh, what's going on in the uh, genome, uh, structure of the genome. So now it's a more, it just sort of evolved into this more sub, you know, substantial questions than just algorithms, but actually what is the, uh, leading the genome? And that's what I'm doing now is in understanding uh, this process of uh, the heartbeat. So we're doing now using dynamics of the uh, genome eventually to see why uh, we can have a heartbeat. So this, you know, it's a function and it goes through proteins. Proteins give the function, proteins in the cells give the, define the function of the cell. So you have to coordinate the cells and that's the idea of getting a model for the heartbeat. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's a problem. Uh, you know, I to, when I did that, I, I could be, became an economist for a while in the 70s. I, in fact, I, the econo, economics department at Berkeley asked me to join, and I did. And uh, it was partly through uh, one person there, Gerard de Bru, uh, economist. And he was interested in some sort of mathematical support for what he was doing, and that eventually got me interested in what equilibrium theory was. And uh, so I spent several years, much of the 70s, working in economics, economic theory with mathematics. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of advantages and disadvantages of working in a, with a different group of people, like the economists. So uh, on one hand, they're a little, uh, you know, protective so that they are not uh, supportive of somebody coming in. There is that force. But also they like to see uh, what they're doing reinforced by having somebody come in like me. So it's mixed. It's mixed. In biology, uh, something similar because biologists uh, and computer scientists do not really understand, for the most part, or differential equations. And so that's what I'm using to understand the heart, for example, and the differential equations. And so that uh, makes it hard, you know, biologists have rejected uh, papers of mine because uh, they say anything like that should be put in an appendix, but I can see that the main part of the <laughs> paper. <laughs> and, uh, Is there any mathematics that comes out of, for example, that biological research? Uh, probably, yeah, yeah, sure. Oh yeah, we did. One of my papers uh, changed the way of looking at uh, bi basic bifurcations called the pitchfork bifurcations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I go back to the. Yeah, go ahead. That's right. Can I go back to the end of the 50s and beginning of the 60s when you were in Brazil? Yeah. Uh, do you think it played a substantial role? in your field now in 1966, because it's just a few years before. And well, was there anything substantial, substantial about your time in Brazil for your research? Well, the six months in Brazil, uh, or when I first formulated, it's the 90, spring of 60, where I first <coughs> formulated both this uh, horseshoe dynamics and other dynamics related to that, as well as the Poincaré conjecture work I did. And how much did they overlap? Some, because oh. I think I was working uh, in dynamics, 
differential equations in Brazil, because of Mauricio, uh, I worked out some of this, what's called gradient dynamics from manifolds. I was always looking at everything on the manifolds. I had a topological background. So uh, looking at these dynamics, this dynamical system on a manifold, allowed <coughs> me to see the structure of the manifold much better than other structures. Because you take cells corresponding to the equilibria of this gradient dynamics, and you can build up the uh, manifold that way, and then you can start simplifying it. So that played uh, a role. Then I had worked, uh, failed to solve Poincaré's conjecture and crazy, naive attempts while I was in college. But so I knew about it, and I said, uh, I, you know, I was a topologist too, so I knew about it from many points of view. But then I said, this dynamics might give me a better picture of what the uh, manifolds look like. Mm. So that but that's eventually what happened in the for the proof of the Poincaré conjecture. Yeah, so I did. That is all about flows, isn't, isn't it? Apparently, yeah. So is that idea yours then? This idea? Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. Okay, so oh yeah. So that came out of first it was the dynamics. And then the uh, topology all happened in that six months I was in uh, Rio.